Today on the Career Musician Podcast, we have Taylor Swift's former manager, president and CEO of the music industry blueprint, Rick Barker, helping countless artists throughout the world build, grow, and monetize their fan base and show artists just how easy it is to get their music out into the world using the tools that are readily available. His website was designed to help give you the resources to move your music career to the next level. And honestly, I got to say, I had a great time picking Rick's brain about how to most effectively become an independent artist in today's crazy music biz world. Here to tell you all about it himself, Mr. Rick Barker, right here on the Career Musician Podcast. Hey, hey. Hey, how are you? There he is. It's a good word. I was just trying to impersonate your deep voice. Yeah. <laughs> I love You have to use all three testicles. <laughs> 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 All right, I love this. This is the great way to That's start an interview. Yeah. <laughs> Rick Barker, welcome to the Career Musician Podcast. Let me just say, I'm a huge fan, dude. I don't even really know you. We've spoken a couple times on Clubhouse through our mutual friend, Michael Elsner. I've been watching you now probably almost a year online, do your thing. And I remember it came up in conversation one day. I was like, Michael, have you heard of this guy? I was like, get out of here. So he's like, yeah, I hung out with, with Rick. Me and he and I met and we started working together. So small world welcome thank you yeah it is a small world michael and i were introduced by his neighbor and yep. he's probably one of the most organized artists that i've ever met you know he <laughs> travels around with a journal and he keeps all his notes and he takes all his notes and it was interesting because he was he had created his master music licensing course and had put it out there. And, and I said, listen, I'm doing these webinars. And I started sharing him. I had just invested $25,000 to get this guy to write my webinar for me because I know the power of a copywriter. And I know that with the right words in the right order, it can make all the difference in the world. So I showed him my webinar and I gave him the book. Uh, it's called One to Many from Jason Fladlin that he had given me. And I gave him access to the course and the step-by-step -step details on how to lay out these, these slides for this webinar. So Michael was getting on a plane to go to China to play guitar for this kid. Okay. And Michael watched the whole, and he had downloaded the presentation. He read the book, he watched it. He wrote his webinar. By the time he got back from China, he was ready to do this thing. So I coached him in on a couple different things and he ended up doing his next launch. It just goes to show one, the power of letting people in your general vicinity know what it is that you're looking for, what it is that you might need. And then it also shows the power of coaching. It also shows the power of being willing to invest in yourself, being willing to take the time to learn and things like that. And that's what I think musicians forget today is they think that it's all about the creation of the product. It's all about the creation of the music. And I always tell the artists that I work with, I don't care how great your music is if no one hears it. So we have to start focusing on some of those other parts. And that's the not so fun stuff, but that's the stuff that puts the word business in music business. You've got the music side taken care of. Now we have to understand and treat it like a business. I love that. That is the whole premise behind the career musician, teaching people that it, it is actually a career and you have to treat it as such. You have to do the stuff that, you, like you said, you're not so inclined to do or you just don't care to do. I like to try to break up the routine, right? 8 a.m. to 12 do all the business stuff, get all that crap out of the way, all of the, the logistics and the organizing and the spreadsheets. And then after lunch, go in your studio and create, you know? So at least you have a duality there every day, right? Yeah, and if you're a inspirational person in the morning, do your creative stuff in the there morning and do the business stuff in the afternoon. I mean, there is no yeah. set of rules, but the bottom line is both parts have to be looked after on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, the difference between talent and an artist is the business side of things. Talent can sing, they can rap, they can make beats. An artist can do all of the same things the talent can do, except they have an LLC, they have a website, they have structure, they have other people in their business. And we're not necessarily saying that you have to do it all, but in the beginning of your career, you are your first manager, you are your first publisher, you are your first booking agent, you are your first everything, you are the record label. Up until the point that somebody else starts writing the checks, you are the record label. So you need to understand what it means 
to run your own record label. And that's where I have shifted my focus over the past seven years is from consulting major labels and major corporations and managing superstars and managing artists that are signed to labels as I shifted my focus to say, okay, I've got a choice. I can put all my eggs into this one basket, cross my fingers, hope that everything works out, hope that they stay a priority at the label, hope that they get on every major tour, hope that they continue to want to show up and do the work every day and make a million dollars in commissions as a manager, or I can take my 30 years of experience, put it online and help thousands of people all over the world at a much lower price point and still generate the income that I want to generate to support my family and run the lifestyle that I want to have and things like that. So it's just a mind shift is all it is. What inspired you to get into music? I always say, you know, when did the bug bite you and how did, how did it come up? Yeah. The bug bit me at a very young age. I've always loved music. You know, there's pictures that my grandparents had of me at two years old where they would put headphones on so I could go to sleep. I, I would sleep well to the music. I always wanted to be, a radio disc jockey. I did not have the talent or the patience to learn the instrument. I admire all of you people. I've always had the gift and the ability to promote. So I would just find talented people and promote them. But radio was always the path that I ultimately wanted to take. I had no aspirations of working for record companies. I had no aspirations of being a manager. I got my dream after I got sober. I went through a bout with drugs uh, and alcohol in the late 80s. Uh, I went from living homeless on the streets, addicted to crack cocaine, to ultimately launching one of the biggest stars in the world. And the reason that I share that on whatever platform I'm on is to let people know that your past does not define your future if you don't want it to. So, and I'm, I'm definitely living proof of that. But uh, the first thing I did when I got sober in 1989 is I went and I applied for internships at radio stations. I lived in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles at the time. And the first person that took my call and gave me a chance was Kiss FM in uh -huh. Los Angeles, home to Rick Dees, uh, one of the biggest, most powerful radio stations in the world. I got a job answering phones. And uh, right about that time is when the Gulf War started. And they came to me and they're like, look, you know, go listen to the news, write down everything that's being said. We want you to deliver the news because we can't get a news guy in fast enough. So I went in, I did what I was told. I wrote everything down and then I went in, the microphone comes on and I was terrible. <laughs> I absolutely sucked because what I did was, is I tried to sound like everyone else that I heard on the radio. Mm -hmm. And back then it was the puking voice and, and here's the news and you talk like, and you do all this stuff. And the lesson that I learned there and I teach through stories was that they want you to be yourself. People are hiring you to be you. They don't need you to be the next someone else. They already have that. They want you to be the first you. So when artists come to me or managers or labels and say, hey, we've got the next, you know, uh, Post Malone, I'm like, well, we have the current Post Malone. You know, we have the next Taylor Swift. Well, she's not dead yet. We still have Taylor Swift. So I always want to encourage artists to be the first them. So as I got this gig in radio, I ended up moving to Santa Barbara, did my whole entire radio career in Santa Barbara, got there in my early 20s, uh, ended up working at a pop station. My first radio name was Ricky Suave. Go ahead and laugh. Okay, um, now hold on. I got to ask yeah. you, did you always have this amazingly rich, deep voice? I did, yeah. Oh. It, it, my voice changed at about 13 years old. My dad used to tease me because I grew up in Alabama. And he was like, and my parents were divorced, so my dad would call and be like, Hi, Daddy. How you doing? And then one day it's like, hey, Daddy. He's like, all of a sudden it just switched uh, right away. So this is just me. This is my voice. People are always like, oh, I love when you talk in your radio voice. I'm like, this is just how I talk. This is me. But uh, yeah, so I've always had that voice, but I did pop radio. I ended up doing rock radio. Uh, had the opportunity in the early 90s. Santa Barbara, we had quite the music scene going on at the time. We had Toad the Wet Sprocket and Ugly Kid Joe and mm. Dishwalla and all these bands that were doing really well. And I ended up being asked to be an executive producer on these two CDs called Santa Barbara's Unsigned Heroes, Volume 1 and 2. And what an executive producer does is the I basically provided some of the funding. I helped raise the money. 
and I promoted it. I had zero experience or nothing to do with the creative side, but hey, I was listed as the executive producer on this record, and I was promoting bands at clubs and doing all this stuff. In 2001, 9-11 happened. Mm. At that point, I had almost gotten out of radio. I was coaching uh, soccer. Uh, that was always been a passion of mine. I was working at the university coaching soccer. Uh, I thought I wanted to get out of radio. It was at a time when the big companies were coming in and they were starting to buy up all the local small radio stations. And it just wasn't fun anymore. And one of the things that I realized is that if I'm getting up at 4.30 in the morning, I better love what it is that I'm doing. And I heard you say that on Clubhouse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The love and the passion just wasn't there. But a buddy of mine called and he said, listen, I just bought uh, my, my childhood radio station up. It was a little bit north of Santa Barbara. He said, I'm building a country radio station and I would love for you to come run the station and be the morning guy. And I said, well, the first thing I ask is, are you buying it to try to sell it? He said, no, this is something that I'm passionate about. I said, great. Cause I'm tired of working my tail off to make other people millions. And then at the end of the day, I'm just another statistic at that point. So he said, no, I thought to myself, I'm like, okay, I grew up in Alabama. I knew who Johnny Cash was. I was as qualified as anyone else in California to run this country radio station. So this was in October, right after September 11th happened. And at that time, the world was in a different place. At that time, everything kind of shifted. And I started listening to this music, this country music. And trust me, I was the guy that made fun of it like everyone else. You know, what happens when you play a country song backwards? You get your truck back, your dog back, your girlfriend back. You know, I was making fun of it just like everyone else. But as I'm listening to this music and the way that they told stories and the way that the songs were crafted, I absolutely I fell in love with it. And so we started this station. I ended up getting what's called reporting status, where I would share the songs that I played with a chart. And when that happens, you get on the radar of the record companies. The record companies started bringing artists through. I started getting to meet artists. I started getting to ask questions. I always tell people, you know, I'm never the smartest guy in the room, but I always ask really good questions. And the questions that I were asking were things like, why don't we ever get to hear them play? Why don't, if I'm your last stop tonight, let's put them on stage. Let's put them in front of an audience. And I started hearing things like, well, they don't have enough material to play for a half hour. And I would pause for a second. I'm like, wait a minute. I came from the rock world and the hip hop world and things like that. I'm like, wait, you just signed someone to a million dollar deal and they can't even play for 30 minutes. They're like, no, they had this song. We fell in love with this song. And Wow. They also said to me, like, well, they're unfamiliar. No one knows who they are. I said, but if I play them on my station and I tell people how excited I am and they hear the music and they like the music, I can get the audience excited. Right. They're like, well, why would you be willing to do that? I said, they said their songs aren't on the chart. I'm like, I don't care about the chart. I care about my community. I know the music that they like. So, I asked for the opportunity to do that. I said, what if I could get radio to pay? There's like, there's no way. Because with the way that radio tours work is usually the record companies will cover all the expenses for the artists to go do these free, as they call it, radio shows. That's right. To promote and, a new project. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I said, well, I said, who are you asking? They said, well, when we talked to the program directors, I said, well, the program director is not the smartest and most powerful person in the building, it's the sales manager because they'll go to a venue and they'll ask for money. And once they get money from that venue, they're going to come to me and say, you will play this music because we don't want the venue to fail because radio stations only make money through selling commercials. That's the only way that they're able to monetize. So I said, well, what if I could find stations that would be willing to do that? And they kind of laughed. And that was the end of that conversation. Well, I started calling radio stations just randomly. Mm. And I was a nobody. I just said, hey, my name is Rick Barker. I program a radio station in Santa Barbara. I said, if I can get artists that are on the lower end of the chart to come to California once a month, because Nashville, it was expensive to bring them to California. So they would very seldom show up. I said, could you come up with 1500 bucks, three hotel rooms, dinner, and get the, a place for the audience or for the artist to perform? And they were like, sure, absolutely. So I created this revenue stream 
I called the folks in Nashville. I said, I've got eight radio stations. I mean, big stations like LA, Sacramento, Bakersfield, you know, all these stations. So they flew me out to Nashville. I met with all the VP of promotion at the record companies. I met with the A&R people. I mean, they treated me like a king. It was a great three days. I come back to Santa Barbara at the time and nothing. Oh. Crickets. No one. So I pick up the phone and I'm like, hey, listen, I love the hotel. I love the steak dinners. I said, but I need an artist for this to be able to work. And this was May. And they said, well, unfortunately, all of our bigger acts are out on tour this summer. So the promotion reps for the record companies are running meet and greets. And they're the ones that are getting all the attention. I said, wait a minute. I said, so you sign this artist to your record company and now they're having to sit and wait. They're ready. You've got a song and everything. They're like, yeah, we just don't have enough people to be able to do this. I said, well, what if I took them out? I'm the one who built these relationships anyway, send them to California I'll pick them up at the airport. I'll put them in my red suburban at the time. I said, I'll make this trip with them. And they said, great. They gave me an artist. His name was Josh Turner. At the time, he had a song called Long Black Train. And what they said was, they said, listen, this is working in the Midwest and in the South. But if we can get an area like California, that's not as religious as other parts of the country, mm -hmm. if they fell in and started loving the song, we know it could work. So they sent out Josh. We went on that run. He made 7,500 bucks. He was happy, went back to Nashville, told everyone what happened. And then the rest is history. The next thing you know, I'm breaking acts like Little Big Town and Sugarland, who went on to win Grammys. That put me on the radar of Scott Borchette at Big Machine Records, who then hired me as a West Coast regional promoter for Big Machine Records. And I asked Scott, I said, Scott, I said, why me? I said, anyone would love to have the opportunity to work for you. He was the best promotions guy. Everyone loved him. He said, Rick, he said, listen, he says, I'm starting this record company with a 15 year old named Taylor Swift that no one's ever heard of. Mm -hmm. He said, I have this regional act out of Texas named Jack Ingram. He said, and they are going to use that as a reason to fail. He said, you just seem to go in one direction. He said, I say this as a compliment. He said, you're too dumb to know any better. And that's a quality. And I'm like, wait a minute. I know I didn't finish high school. <laughs> no, I, but I know I'm, uh, how is that a compliment? But I knew what he meant. I understood yeah, exactly what tenacity. he meant. It's tenacity, like sheer yeah. un, un, unbridled tenacity, baby. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. And that was the first time in my life that I realized that people were hiring me, not for what college I went to, not for what degree I had, but for the execution that I had implemented. It's like in life, we get paid for done. There are great starters, but they're terrible finishers. And depending on what it is, we've all been there, whether it be a diet, whether it be a relationship, whether it be an album, whether it be a project, whatever it is. So I just kind of got the reputation as being a solutions-based person and someone that could solve problems. So he hired me. They sent me Taylor, said, teach her radio, uh, teach her the performance, take her on that little tour, the Nashville to you radio tour. And she came out. We spent 30 days together. That absolutely changed both of our lives. I wanted to teach. She wanted to learn. I also had coached girls high school soccer a couple of years before that. And what I realize now is that was God preparing me for Taylor because I speak teenage female. I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, but I understood her and I was the right person for her at that stage in her career. Six months after that, uh, they went interviewed with all the management companies. Uh, most of them told her no. Uh, other ones that she just didn't feel comfortable with. And then her dad called and said, what would you say if I told you Taylor wanted to be her manager? And I said, I'd say no. He paused for a second. He's like, wow, that's not what we thought. I said, I'm not qualified. I've never managed an artist before. And he said, Rick, he said, let me tell you something. He said, first off, you guys trust each other. He said, second, he said, you're not afraid to ask for help. He said, a lot of people think not knowing right. is the problem. It's not knowing and not being willing to get the answers is what the problem is. He says, and we know that you will put everything you have on the line for our daughter. And that's what we want in a manager. And she wants you. So I agreed to be her manager and did that for almost two years. Uh, amazing. Amazing. So, okay. Wow. I talk about it all the time. Perseverance, determination, diligence, you know, seeing, th seeing things through, being motivated every day, even when you're not motivated. How do you get motivated? Get up and start doing shit. And then that perpetuates more, more, more motivation. You get more stuff done. 
tenacity, the fact that you went to those sales managers at those radio stations, you, you po- spoke to these program directors and said, look, this is what we need to do. I love that, and I always preach that to musicians. Now, we're on two sides of the fence here. I'm, my, what I do is, is, in the, is in the trenches with musicians, the career musician, the players that are backing up artists, and also people who want to be artists. The number one question I get, the reason why I'm separating this here, is, and you're more in the business side, the management. The number one question I get with all of my you know, colleagues or friends or, or whomever or people you know, who are in, in, in the circle how do I get a manager? <laughs> and I always say to them, it's so funny because you say this, you're not ready for a manager. How do you know you're even ready for a manager? And with that, I'd like to introduce your platform. Now, your, your URL is just rickbarker.com. I love your podcast, The Music Industry Blueprint. You have so many different resources for people who are wondering, I need a manager. How do I get a manager? Go there. Go rickbarker.com, Music Industry Blueprint podcast. Rick, tell us about that. This is you reinventing yourself. Yeah. So what I realized was was that what most people, they couldn't afford a manager first off. So it was going to be really hard to get a manager. There are millions of artists and hundreds of managers that those millions of artists want. So it's not physically possible for a manager to have as many people that reach out to them. So I was speaking at the uh, CD Baby DIY Musician Conference, and I said, how many of you made $100,000 with your music last year? Raise your hand. And about three people in the room raised their hand. I said, well, had you made $100,000, your manager would have only made $15,000. Right. How many people could feed their families and run your career for $15,000. Mm-hmm. And that's when the light bulb went on in that room. I said, what you guys need is management guidance. You need someone that can help you with goal setting, structure, accountability, making sure that you're registering your business properly. Make sure that you're doing the things that you need to do to be a successful business. Because right now, the record companies, the management companies, the booking agents, when we shifted from selling $20 CDs to now sharing in 0. 0.00, whatever the percentage of a penny is, the game changed at that point. The, the millions and millions of dollars that were being made off these CDs off of just one or two artists meant a label could have 10 artists and they could put a little money in development and kind of divvy the pot out. Well, that changed. Your talent didn't change. Uh, Your dreams and desires didn't change, but the people that were in a position to help you at that time is what changed. So now we are in the let's go out and invest in small business mentality. So you today have all of the resources that you needed a manager for, a record label for, a publisher for, all of those abilities you can now do. You have direct access to upload your music through a distributor. Before you needed a record company because there were only four distributors. And if you weren't with one of those record companies, you couldn't distribute your music to all of the platforms. Now you could print CDs and you could print vinyl and you could sell them to people at your shows, but you weren't getting your songs at Tower Records and Best Buys and Walmarts and things like that. You weren't getting pitch to radio because that was kind of set up for the record companies. Now everyone's phone is their radio. So now you're able to do all these things. So when people started coming to me wanting to pick my brain, uh, what they were wanting to hear from me was I thought whatever artist they brought me was the best thing in the world. And I would walk them into a record company. (laughs) What I normally saw were people that weren't ready that needed to continue to get their business set up properly, work at their craft, hone their craft, write a hundred songs, play 50 shows. You know, these people had one song and no performance, but they thought they were all ready for a record deal because that's what they were told. Or they all thought they were a manager because that's what their friends told or their neighbors, you're the best little kid in your city. And they're like, you should be on the radio. I'm like, great, then go to your local radio station. But what I saw and what I kept saying over and over and over again, got to the point where I'm like, I can't do 50 lunches in a week. I can't take 50 hours 
out of my week to give to people just because they ask, but they all seem to be asking the same questions and needing the same answers. So that's when I first developed my first course seven years ago called the Music Industry Blueprint. It was the four pillars of success in the music business. It was how to set up your business, how to monetize your business, how to nurture your fan base and how to sell. That's kind of what I, I focused on. And I also realized at the time that I had, I was typing, I was going into YouTube, how to get a record deal. It's like 2010, how to get a record deal, how to get a publishing deal, how to find a manager. And everything that I saw, those videos were like old interviews of Clive Davis or LA Reed, or they were videos from people who'd had no success, just trying to teach people how to do things. So I realized at that point that I needed to make a mind shift for myself. So I went all in and started learning from some of the best digital marketers in the world. I started investing in myself to get the education that I needed. And it was absolutely crazy the amount of people that flocked to me to get this stuff. So yeah, it was it was kind of nuts, but that's how the music industry blueprint and what it is I do today all came about. And then the technology changed and things like that. So yeah, I love what I do. It's amazing and it clearly comes out. One of the things that really speaks to me is your videos and anything online that you see, you can see the passion and you can see the uh, the down to earth, no bullshit, you know, style. And I love that. I'm a tried and true New Yorker. <laughs> like I'm no BS all the time. So when everyone I, thinks I'm from New York and yeah, I'm not, you yeah, know, exactly, it's just, yeah. I, I look like Alabama. an Italian. What's that? I can't hear the Alabama. No, no, there's no yeah. Alabama accent. <laughs> no, when I first started doing radio in California, they yeah. said to me, they said, look, we love your energy and your enthusiasm, but no one in California wants to listen to a hick talk all day. <laughs> so what I did was I put a VHS tape. This shows you how old I am. I'm 53 years old. I put in a tape and I started taping the local news and I started learning to talk the way they speak because they have perfect, you know, everything. And then it's like, so today on the 405 freeway, there was an accident and my name's blah, 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 and they would spit out their name and that's where you would hear the accent. And I'm like, and oh, this is brilliant. Yeah. So, you know, I just learned to talk like the news people and I started reading out loud. That was yeah. one of the things I did too. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. All right, Rick, let, let me let me ask some pointed questions. So let's say we you know, we kind of talked about artists and when they need management and what the like you said, you were getting all the same questions. So now you have these resources. Everybody can go get them. Let's talk about a musician. Let's say somebody who was on tour with Taylor Swift playing in their backup band or, you know, uh, re, uh, whoever it is, whether it's uh, Ariana Grande, you know, I don't care whomever M Eminem and they're saying man I have this talent I know I'm good at it I know I'm earning money I have a career but how can I take it to the next level what do you tell like the side man musician sure first I ask them what does the next level mean to them you know because success means something different it's like they may say like me the reason I left Taylor is I knew I could not be a father to my kids and a husband to my wife if I'm gone 187 days that's right a year uh, and that's when I had to make the decision. Do I become a millionaire at what expense or so on and so forth? So it may be a side man or woman who is like, I've done my time on the road. Now I just want to be in the studio. Okay. So let's figure what that looks like. You know what? I just want to give lessons. You know, I, I just want to have a handful of people because of my accolades. I can charge more than that person that's at the guitar center, not putting anything down about the guitar center, but your knowledge and experience, no one can have, but you can rent it to them. So they, that's what I tell people. You can't go do the days I did. You can't be on the tours that I was on. You can't do all that stuff, but I can sell you my experience so that you don't have to make the same mistakes I did and you can learn faster. So for that side person, it's first off, decide what it is that you want to do. Uh, today, what's great is you could build a business where you could play guitar for all these independent artists where they can go say, Hey, so-and-so who played for Madonna is featured on my record. And you can record that at your house and send the stems to these kids. And you know, it's like, there's so many different things. It's like, you could be a work for hire. You could take your accolades and say, Hey, how would you like to be able to go to your audience and say, the producer that did this or the keyboardist who did this or the drummer that did this right. is playing on my record. I saw a lot of that happen when COVID went down because all of my buddies 
who are touring musicians were out of work. Yeah. So they had options. So they're now all coming to me going, dude, you've been doing this online business for a while. What can you do to help us? And this is a real conversation that I had was you should be getting paid as a work for hire. No, they can't afford your union rates. No, they can't afford this. But my God, if somebody, if you found 10 people a month that wanted to say that you played on their record and you charge them 300 bucks to do the guitar parts, all of a sudden you're making $3,000 a month. And that's more than the unemployment checks that you're getting and the stimulus checks that you're getting right now. And it can keep you afloat until this happens. You also may want to write a course, create a course. You may want to start building an email list that then you can go handpick students from, you know, the five things never to do when getting to a gig. Who are the five people that you should get to know? You know, how to be nice to the sound man, because he could be the next guy that lets <laughs> your band, in. you know, all these different experiences. Because yes. what I was told before is that if you're on chapter three of a book, you have something to sell everyone who's on chapter one. Why? Because you're two chapters ahead of them. And that's the same thing. It's like there's life experiences that you have that people will pay for. And that's what I've done. I've helped. I have artists of mine who, you know, booked 80 house concerts. I'm like, let's teach people how to do that. We'll put a couple videos together. We'll put a couple check sheets together. We'll charge 47 bucks. I've got an email list of 53,000 people. If we go find a thousand of those people that will pay your 47 bucks, you just made $47,000. And we did that on numerous occasions. I have one of my clients, Pamela Parker. You guys should look her up. She's brilliant. Every time she sings, people are just floored. So I had Pamela create her vocal warmups. It took her an hour. We put it down. We told her, if you only have 15 minutes before the show, make sure you do warm-ups A and B. If you get 30 minutes, do A, B, and C. She walked them through. She did the warm-up. She did everything. So we just created a $27 vocal warm-up class, and she sold the crap out of it. You know? So now it, it's, I mean, and, and I hate to say this, but many of these artists, these side hustles that I'm teaching them, they're making more money from that than they are with their music right now. And it's allowing them the ability to fund their music. Cause here's the part that got screwed with COVID at the recording of this. We are in a very interesting time right now is there aren't a lot of tours and things happening right, right now. Absolutely. And it kind of freaked everybody out for a second. All of a sudden people were like, wow, everything that we took for granted, all of a sudden disappeared. Mm. So I'm so crazy. Glad- I'm so you know, glad you said right. that. Take, yeah, take for granted. We just had another interview this morning, and uh, a, 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 a fantastic musician had a stroke, lost the use of his left arm. Well, saxophonist, right? Yeah. Re- re- pivoted, reinvented himself, plays a one handed saxophone that he created. Okay. Anybody heard of Def Leppard? Yeah, exactly. The one armed drummer, of course. Exactly. Yeah. Same concept. Yeah. And one of the things he said was you know what? Before, prior to my stroke, I, I had taken my musical gifts for granted. And oftentimes that, that is the case, you know, you just don't think about it. Well, the bigger problem that I saw too, and I ended up doing a video that I shared because I I knew an artist wouldn't be comfortable doing it. And I wanted to touch on some topics that it would seem weird coming from the artist. So I did a video called what fans can do right now to support your favorite artist. And I explained to them, I said, those independent artists that I read your comments about, oh my gosh, I proposed with your song. It was the first song. My first dance at my wedding was this song. I played your song at my father's funeral. I said, these songs that are changing people's lives. I said, these bands that you're telling them how great their stuff is. I said, those independent artists, what you don't understand is that they fund the recording of those songs. They fund the creation of those songs and the part-time jobs that they had to be able to fund you having a song at your first dance and you having a song at your wedding are the Uber drivers, the Lyft drivers, the bartenders, the restaurant people. Those businesses are also shut down. I said, here's how you can help. And I'm like, when they go on and do a Facebook live and they put up their virtual tip jar, throw them a couple bucks. But what I told to the artist is I said, listen, I said, strangers will walk up on the street that we don't know and ask us for a dollar. And most of us give up whatever we have. Mm. Why is it that your fans will give money to complete strangers, but they won't give money to you? (sighs) 
And they paused for a second. I said, the answer is because you didn't ask. ask. People don't know what your problems are until you share them. Now, don't be that person that just shows up when you need stuff all the time. Right. We don't like those people in our lives. But when you could tell stories and say, listen, you know, I had planned, I had a, one of my artists, he called up and he was pissed because he had a hundred dates canceled and he had a living room full of boxes of merch. Wow. And he goes, Rick, what am I going to do with all this merch? I said, you're going to sell it. So what do you mean I'm going to sell it? I said, you're going to go on Instagram live. You're going to do exactly what I tell you. And you're going to sell those t-shirts. He goes, all right, what do I got to say? I said, you're going to go to them and say, guys and gals, I was so excited to see you this summer. I'd been waiting all summer. I had all this merchandise that you guys have been requesting and wanting that I was going to bring to the shows this summer. But with everything canceled, I'm sitting on these boxes of inventory. I said, I want you to open up a box and I want you to pull out a piece of merch. See this t-shirt? Let me explain to you. When we play at shows, I have to charge you 25 bucks for it. The reason is the venue wants their percentage. I got to pay for gas. I got to pay my guys, my band. There's a lot of expenses that go along with this. But right now I don't have those expenses, but I do have this merchandise. 10 bucks, 15 bucks for a t-shirt. Tell me what you're willing to pay. I'll be more than happy to send it out to you with a little thank you note. And he ended up selling, you know, almost 300 t-shirts by just going on Instagram live, telling his fans what the situation was, getting some humanization behind that. And they wanted to support him. Why? Because he asked. So don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid. Vulnerability is so powerful. You know, it's like when I share my personal story, yes. all of a sudden people will come to me and go, my gosh, you were so vulnerable. Thank you. Or at the beginning of any of my webinars, people have pretty much figured out that I'm going to be selling something, you yeah. know? So why hide it? So I come out and I say, look, I'm going to perform for the next 45 minutes. Hopefully I did a good enough job. You want to come to my merch table. And at the end, I'm going to create an opportunity. If you think having me on your team makes sense, you feel having access to me on a weekly basis could help your music career. Then I'm going to make that opportunity available for the right person. If that bothers you, then you can go now. You can stick around. The free stuff I'm going to share with you right now is going to be perfect. And that. on a follow-up, I asked a guy, he was from Jamaica. I said, Prince Lou, I said, why did you buy so fast? <laughs> he said, because you told me right away that you were going to sell to me. And I admired that because I came here looking for a solution and you being honest with me in the beginning, let me know that you were the guy that I wanted to get that solution from. And I'm like, okay, great. Thank you. I'll start doing two minute webinars now. Okay. <laughs> he started See, laughing. I love that because one thing that irks me is the webinar that goes on for 75 minutes and then the last 15 minutes they try to sell and you, or, or they, they keep hold, withholding information. You're like, dude, it, just tell me the information. I, I, I will buy it from you. I'll spend 90 bucks on a little workout program, you know, right. but just tell me what the hell it is I got to do. There's part of the you know? reason why people didn't do that because what happens is, is if I tell you right now what I'm going to offer you is $2,000, your brain automatically goes into panic mode. Mm. I haven't been able to justify the value in this $2,000 yet. Right. But I do tell people this, hey, I've got a social media course, it's under 100 bucks, and it's going to give you this, this, and this, but we'll get to that in a little bit. In the meantime, I want to share with you how you can start doing these things today. So mm -hmm. I do slip in the price early, Smart. Because I don't want it to be a surprise and because I hate being that guy on the webinar that yeah. people keep going. A buddy of mine who uh, has a program for film and television, Sync for Film and Television, he has something that everyone wants. He spends so much time on his webinar trying to validate before he gave the price. I'm like, dude, you got to get the price quicker after you've taught them you've earned the right for the right person. You're never going to get everyone or be it for everyone. I'm not the right person for everyone. I always tell people, I'm like sushi. I'm an acquired taste. You know, <laughs> uh, If you want to be famous, I'm the wrong dude. If you yeah. want to know, if you're saying, hey, I'm willing to do the work, I'm willing to invest in myself, I'm willing to hustle, I just want to know what to invest in and what work needs to be done, then I'm your guy. That's the yeah. kind of artist that I can help. So I don't mind doing it, but I also have been doing this long enough and the way people find me is because of my solutions oriented. It's like I was talking to a buddy of mine and his name's Circa and he has the Indiepreneur 
Uh, it's now called the Creative Juice Podcast. He's with Indiepreneur, and he's like, Rick's like the only guy that will kick you in the nuts and hug you at the same time. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's just kind of how I am. And people will say, oh, you're like the Gary Vee of the music business. And I yeah, said, I and like it's that. not because I drop F-bombs, because yeah. I, I might on occasion, but yeah. it's because I'm not going to accept your excuses I'm going to give you the tools that you need to do. The only difference between me me and Gary is Gary's going to tell you what you need to do. I'm going to tell you what you need to do, and I'm going to show you oh, yeah. how to do it. Yeah. Okay, so that's the thing is I, I am a practitioner. I am someone who's actually doing what it is that I teach. When I tell people you need to post every day on Instagram, you go to my Instagram, I'm posting every day. When I tell people you need to put out content in various locations, you go to my various locations, you're going to see content. When I tell people you need to invest in coaching, I invest in coaching. Note to all of you, don't pay for a coach that doesn't pay for a coach. <laughs> or coach doesn't have a coach. Good that's point. not the person that should be coaching you. Well, we're writing that, that. That might be the quote of your episode here. Write that. Not, the, down, not right? to kick him in the nuts and give him a hug, but the <laughs> okay. other one. Okay, the other one. That, that, it might be a tie. <laughs> yeah, that might have to be tweetable somewhere. But yeah, I mean, and, and once again, it's like, don't pay for a coach that doesn't pay for coaching themselves. Yeah. And I did something that was pretty crazy. So right before the holidays, I was raising the prices on my all access program, which gives people all access to me. Sure. And there were a couple of reasons why I was doing it. One was because all these people were coming to me telling me that they had just bought these other uh, people's courses. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, well, why didn't you buy my course? And they said, well, theirs was more expensive. So I thought it was better. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, shame on me for trying to, you know, help hook a brother up and help right, them right. out. Right. But second is I, I showed them one of my mentors, I called, I called Myron up, Myron Golden, an amazing man. You follow him on Clubhouse, Dr. Myron Golden. Okay. Uh, and Myron said to me, he said, first off, Rick, tell me what, how much time you spend with people. I said, well, every Monday I'm doing live coaching in a group. He goes, how many hours ago? A couple hours. I said, I'm answering probably seven hours worth of emails a week, giving guidance and instruction. He goes, well, what do you charge for that? I said, right now it's $1,997 a year. He said, well, first off, you need to put two zeros on that. I'm like, Myron, I, I don't disagree with that, but the market that I'm in, right. I don't know that that can be justified yet. He says, okay. He says, well, what are you moving the price up to? I said, uh, $4,000 a year. He said, okay. So for $300 a month, they get the ability, a little over 300 bucks. I said, yeah. He said, you don't want people that don't find value in that in your world. He said, one thing you're going to realize is not all money is the right money. Mm. And I said, I, he said, think about this, Rick. He says, if you're the best, no one expects you to be the cheapest. He said, but think about this. He says, who in your world gives as much time as you do, has, for lack of a better word, accolades that you do, has had the success that you've had? I said, no one. He says, do you ever see Tesla and Lamborghini and Ferrari discounting the price of their cars? He goes, no. You see a wait list for people to purchase those cars. And some people will pay more than what people are asking because they want to be at the front of the line. He said, you are doing them a disservice by trying to constantly be that person. And I went, Myron, this is why I love you. And this is why I pay what I pay. So a couple of weeks ago, I did this town hall meeting, said, I'm raising my prices. I'll explain why I'll share this stuff. So I ended up showing my tax returns from 2018 and 2019 to everyone that was on my list. So I showed them the returns. This is what I made. This is what the expenses were. For those of you that say, thanks for all the free stuff. Well, according to my income tax return, it cost me about $30, uh, $30,000 a year to do my podcast, my YouTube channel, pay for the assistance, pay for the people to do all the work. So what may be free to you cost me about 30 grand. I said, but what I want you to look at is that number over there. And it showed that in 2018, I paid $40,000 for coaching mm -hmm. and being involved in masterminds. And in 2019, I paid almost $90,000. I said, so guys, I'm investing in myself to learn how to do 
podcast, to learn how to shoot videos, to buy a $6,000 YouTube course to teach me how to be able to put free videos out every week so that you can run your business and get your music to as many people. I said, so I just want to show you what I'm already investing in myself, which in return is me investing in you. And all of a sudden, people understood it. But what did I have to do? I had to talk about a very uncomfortable subject, which is money. Money. I had to tell people I'm raising my prices and show that it's not just a money grab because, and then I thought about it for a second and I'm like, wait, if the person can't justify investing $97 into their business or $4,000 to have someone help them run their business and guide them in their business, they're not going to succeed in this business anyway. So don't worry about them. Mm -hmm. Not you're not going to be right for everyone. And and that's what I really realized at that point was the person who set their business up properly, the person that understands that the best athletes in the world have coaches, the everyone, the best golfers in the world. Tiger Woods can beat everyone. Well, guess what? He's got four different coaches. One helps him with putting, one helps him with mindset, one helps him with his swing, one helps him with his physical fitness. I mean, all the best people that perform at the highest levels have coaches. Why shouldn't the artist? Hey, it's Rick Barker, host of the Music Industry Blueprint Podcast, former manager of superstar Taylor Swift, author of the $150,000 music degree and creator of the Music Industry Blueprint. You are listening to the Career Musician Podcast with my bud, Nomad. Go behind the scenes with host Nomad to gain inside knowledge of entertainment business from the world's leading musicians, artists, producers, managers, and more. Being a career musician is more than just gigs and sessions. Are you a career musician? Find out on the Career Musician Podcast, streaming everywhere. Amen. I we could stop the podcast right there and that would be enough. I mean, really, everybody, I hope you hear that and hear it multiple times. Wow. Okay. That being said, here's the big question, because so many independent creatives struggle with this. How do you define success? Success is different to every single person. I always usually will ask questions. I always, I'm that smart ass guy. Sometimes you ask a question, I'll ask a question back. And it usually gives us the answer in there. Yeah. I said, if you can make 30 to 40, $50,000 a year doing what you love, being your own boss, you're making more than most people doing what they hate. Mm. Success means something different. I have people that come to me that just want to make 30 grand. They hit that number, that's success. I have some people that they put success is they got signed by a record label. I don't usually work with those people because that's out of our hands. I try to keep what we can control. So determine what success means to you. I want you guys to all have goals, but I want you to have realistic goals and set little milestones for yourself. I want you to say success to me would be having 1,000 email addresses that I now have the ability to make an offer to on a monthly basis. That's the first part of your success. Okay, now that I have this, success to me would be releasing a record at the end of the year that I can bundle a $40 offer together to make to those 1,000 people. But wait, it took me a month to, to get 1,000 emails. Six months later, if you continue doing what is working, you're now going to have about 5,000 emails. Mm -hmm. And let's say that only half of them want to purchase what it is that you're offering. That's 250 people you make an offer to them multiple times throughout the year. The bottom line is you've got to give people opportunities throughout the year in order to purchase from you. And the more you do that, the more that you're going to make. But when someone identifies and determines what success means to them, it's like if you wrote music that you loved and it changed people's lives, did you fail? <laughs> Heck no. Well, that's the thing. Everyone's different. Someone say, yeah, because I didn't make a million. Mm -hmm. Well, if your goal is to make a million, you're going to need a whole bunch of people that love what you do. Because here's the thing we have to realize. 
We're trying to function in a dysfunctional business because our rewards are not in direct proportion to the work that we put in. You can show up every day and do what you feel is right and still not get the quote unquote validation that you Uh, want. uh. We are in a position where the consumer does not have to pay to consume your product. Think about what businesses, if you could just walk into the car dealership and pick the car you want and leave or the McDonald's or wherever, the ultimate investment that is going to be made in you is through the relationship that you build. So my whole focus in the business is I teach people how to build, nurture, and monetize a fan base. I don't teach them how to get publishing deals because that's out of my control. That's a byproduct of a lot of different things happening. I don't teach people how to get record deals because that's a byproduct of a lot of different things happening, a lot of things out of our control. What I want you to do when someone comes to me, I say, what's a realistic goal that you want to hit within the next 90 days? And if they say, I want to be the opening act for so-and-so, I'm like, great. How many live shows did you play? last year. Well, I haven't started playing shows yet. Then that's not a realistic goal. So let's start with maybe five shows. Let's get you to perform five times right now. Boom. We just hit a milestone. We just hit something that we can parlay because this whole business, I, I think anything in life, it's just a series of next. Once you hit that, what's next? Once you hit that, what's next? Because the key for all of this And in my position is I have to prepare you for whatever opportunity might come your way. Yes, I have you know, record label presidents on my phone that I could call and get a meeting with. But if I walk you in there and they say, so how many songs have they written? Well, they only have this one song. Rick, why are you wasting my time? That's right. Hey, booking agent at CAA, you got to check this artist out. They're awesome. Great. How many shows did they play last year? Well, they only played 10. Really? How many tickets did they sell? Well, they didn't. They were in coffee shops. Then why are you bringing them to me? Because I can't do anything with them now. Let them, and patience is a very valuable word. It's like, for whatever reason, artists think that they're different. It's like if someone wants to excel in a trade, they go study that trade and they hone in their craft. We have people that go on TV singing cover songs, win a TV show and think they're ready for a record deal. And they're not, you know, they just happen to sing real good for nine episodes and a bunch of stay, uh, you know, women on Facebook thought they were great and voted for them. You know, I was told people when I worked at American Idol, I said, it's like a game show for 50 year old women. You know, it doesn't say that you're the best artist. It says that you sang the best that night. That's all it says. So let's, let's not be afraid to put in our 10,000 hours. Let's not be afraid to hone our craft. You want to be a great songwriter, write songs every day. You want to be a great instrumentalist of some sort, play that instrument every day. Start studying from people that are having success doing what you're wanting to do. When you see Little Nas X win a Grammy, that doesn't mean you should be on TikTok. Your audience may not be on TikTok. What you need to see is that it's possible. And then you What we don't see is that's the tip of the iceberg. We don't see what's below the water. We don't see the no's. We don't see the struggles. We don't see the hundred songs that failed. We only saw the one song that worked. Now let's see what happens, you know? And that's, that's the thing is I just try to manage expectations. That success thing, it's so personal. It's so Uh different. You know, it's like, hell, success to me was getting out of bed this morning because somewhere somebody didn't, you know, it's like, hey, success, I'm breathing. Congratulations to me. Step one. Next. You know, it's like, that. Yeah. Well, Eric G and I just started a 30 day uh, life challenge where we're yeah. waking up at 430, doing our workouts and our whole routine. And I love waking up early. I've done it many times in the past. And that accountability helps, number one. But yeah. number two, like you said, next. So last month, maybe you lost five pounds. Okay, great. What are you going to do next? Right. Well, you got one song placed on a Netflix show. What are you going to do next? You How know? are you going to parlay those five pounds into 10? How are you yeah. going to parlay that Netflix into yeah. a Super Bowl commercial? You know, yeah. what is the series of next? How are you going to parlay that into five Netflix shows? That's right. You know, it's That's like right. if you can, if, if you can, I, I read this quote and it was, I don't know where it was from, but it's like, your goal today should be to be better than you were yesterday. Uh, love it. It's like that. It's yeah. like if, if you struggled yesterday at the gym, you don't stop. You just be better the next day. Yes. And if you gained a pound this week, 
you get better the next week. You know, it's like too often we give up and it's like, don't quit before the payoff. Don't quit before the prize. Don't, you know, every day I've been jumping on clubhouse doing these morning, these morning Ooh, motivations. Your power hour. I, I joined, I yeah. saw one yesterday. I'm going to yeah. do it again. Hey, I, I'm so glad you brought it up because I want to hear your thoughts on clubhouse and all that. Okay. So, sorry. Continue. No, just real quick. I'm going to give you the three that we did this week. So the Monday yeah. quote was all progress takes place outside the comfort zone. And then we talked about that. What's holding you back? What are you unwilling to do? And we kind of focused on that that day. The next one on Tuesday was wake up with determination, go to bed with satisfaction. That's the one I heard. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And then today's was mindset is what separates the best from the rest. Uh, and it's funny. like, it's, I like to start the mornings with positivity. I mean, yeah. Should I start by going on a walk? Probably it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> right now, you know, it's like, uh, should I maybe do these power hours while I'm walking? That may be what happens next week as I say, hey, you guys are showing up. So pardon my huffing and puffing. I'm walking up my hill and that's my dog barking, which you guys may have heard earlier, because just like everyone else, we're working out of the house. Uh, so I just think that that morning routine is super important. One of the things that I learned a long time ago is that don't check your email first thing when you wake up because then you are on someone else's agenda, not your own. I get shut up, I, Eric G. Don't call me out. I never do that. Okay, once in a while, I, I do it. Business stuff at like 5 a.m. I'm like, oh, you're that guy that gets up to take a pee and takes no. his phone in the bathroom. So you're peeing no. with one hand and checking no. Instagram with the other or whatever. But well, we're both up, though. So I'm never like, going to forgive yeah. him for this, by the way. No, but that's internal business. That's with our company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but think but about this. No, right. You had the no, right. let's say this. You're you right. had the intentions of working out with Eric G. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you opened your email and you saw that there was a fire that you needed to put out. Yeah. Now, and then what happens? You end up focusing on that fire and then he yeah. gets the text message, "Sorry, bro, we're going to have to move this to tomorrow." Yeah. And then you lost focus on what you committed to do. Here's the thing about the music industry. Amen. We are not curing COVID. Whatever can wait until you get what you set out to do done. If you have the cure to COVID, interrupt everything that I'm doing, get right to me. But yeah. the bottom line is this, there's nothing that somebody else can call me up or email me with in the morning. If it was important, they would have been at my house or they would have called. If they right. sent an email, it's not as important as we make it out to be sometimes urgent, yeah. and it can derail your day. So yes, you have to get to that at some point, especially if you're a business person like me who has clients and things like that, but whatever they have can wait because if I don't take care of me, I can't serve them the best way possible. And I think that's what we forget sometimes. Staying up late, four hours of sleep, all that stuff may sound great, but you know what? If I'm not my best self, you paid and invested in me to be the best me possible. I can't do that if I don't start my morning with some sort of positivity. And a lot of times you can get caught up in the negativity right away and I just choose not to do it myself. That's just me. Amazing. No, that's a mantra that everybody should hold on to. I love it. Rick, you've shared so many uh, pearls of wisdom, some great advice. Uh, I was just going to ask you about a mantra and you basically coined it right there. Uh, you know, success and how it looks Brother, everything is, is is perfect. You have all these resources. Is there anything you want to say? Oh, I did mention Clubhouse. I love yeah, the fact that you're on Clubhouse every morning. Yeah. Uh, you know, are you doing that power hour every morning, five days a week? Or how you so doing right it? now, I'm doing it this week, Monday through Friday. Uh, it'll be a power half hour on Fridays because I golf every Friday. I have a gentleman that I have a standing. So I will start it for 30 minutes and I'll make someone a moderator. But I insist that the room ends at 10 o'clock. I cut it off at 10 o'clock. I don't want these 14 day rooms or nine hour rooms because yeah. then no one's getting anything done. Yeah. Uh, if they got there late, then maybe they'll show up early tomorrow and make sure that they get there. So mm -hmm. I don't want, I, I want it to be special. What, uh, one of the reasons why I did it at the recording of this is there's a wait list to get in clubhouse. There's a wait list to host your own rooms is I want to have my own room in order to do that, to move up the list. They wanted you to host three rooms and start three rooms. So I did my three rooms. And then today I just filled out the form. Uh, and what that will be at that point is my, my room will be music industry blueprint presents. And one day we may be talking law. One day we may be talking 
uh, sync and television. One may, day we may be talking beats, how to sell yeah. and license your beats. I've got all these different friends in the community. I think Clubhouse is fantastic. I think it's like being at a, a virtual conference, but you can, it can get addicting. You can find yourself spending so much time on there. One of the things I tell my students is at some point you have to stop uh, learning and start doing, stop buying courses and start implementing. You should always be learning. But the point is, is I do what's called just in time learning. Mm -hmm. And Michael Elsner, my buddy, and I talked about that yeah. yesterday is like, I have books and I have courses that I purchased because if somebody asks me something about publishing, I don't want to take a whole publishing course. I don't want to stop my life to take a course. I want to go to that course, grab what it is I need, it put it back on the shelf and then get back to what it is that I'm doing. So we call it just in time learning. We do the same thing in music production and composition all yeah. the time. Yeah. You pull out. Yeah. You go to YouTube, how to use this new plugin, a new plugin comes in. It's like, right. do you want to sit there and spend three hours trying to figure it out on yourself? Or do you want to find some 10 year old kid from England? That's going to show you how to do it in 15 minutes. It's that kid for a while. I, I don't know who that kid was, but for a while, anything I needed, I would type it in. Hello, this is Andrew. And this is how you do this, this, and this. And I'm like, Oh, I want to kill that kid. But he saved my, but save me lots of time yeah dude it's never been easier I, I think i'm the last generation i'm 30 and i think i'm the last generation to know what it's like to still have to go and find an encyclopedia if mm, i needed yeah. to learn something especially I like now that. and now it just whenever you want you got it yeah and that's why there is no excuse it's like the the reason uh, someone was just sharing i was in a clubhouse room before i came here and i was listening in and this artist his name was Kevin. I'd never heard him speak before, but I loved what he had to say as he said, look, all these tools work if you use them. They wouldn't be out if they didn't work. Most people say, oh, that didn't work. No, you didn't do it. Nah, you know, the, nah. all these tools work. Most of you are trying to use the wrong tools and most of you aren't disciplined enough to stay with something when it gets hard. And the biggest difference to, and you know, if you guys follow me on Instagram at Rick Barker music, or uh, I'm trying to get up to a thousand followers on TikTok so I can go live there. So I committed to a TikTok a day, every day. And oh, that's right. I uh, saw that. Yeah. 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 365 days. So we did a bunch <laughs> of batch recording and we could do a whole episode on batch recording content and stuff, but we got that set up going really well. Uh, but just kind of hit me up there because when I hit a thousand followers, then I'm able to go live because what I said and the reason I stayed away from TikTok for a while is I thought the last thing they needed was another 53 year old white dude doing stupid dances. Right. Uh, I didn't feel that I brought value to the platform. And then I was talking one day, I said something, it was about a minute and that guy's like, that's what the, your, your little nuggets are what you should be putting on TikTok that sets you apart. I said, yeah, but I want to teach. Sometimes if I teach on a subject, it's five minutes long. He says, great, break it into five, one minute part series. So I paid a guy that I found on Clubhouse. Uh, his name is Michael Sanchez. His rate was like 400 bucks for two hours. So I went in, paid his money. We got on. He gave me some examples of some people to use. It was like an hour and 15 minutes in. I'm like, dude, I'm done. I got my answers. I don't need to sit here for another 45 minutes just because I paid for it. We'll, I'll, I'll come and ask you a couple questions later, but don't be afraid to get information and pay for information because the information that you can pay, I'll leave you with this story. So there's a guy by the name of Ryan Lee and Ryan is also on Clubhouse. He's one of those gurus and Ryan was helping people set up businesses. He was doing all kinds of things. So I was on a webinar. I'm a webinar junkie. I love to listen to him. I love to learn different styles and things. And yeah, he, he said, and I knew it was a scarcity tactic, but he goes, the, the first nine people get in because you're going to get a half hour consultation with me for $500. So boom, I put the money down. I was typing in, did I get in? Did I get in? I was like so excited. So I go out to the hot tub that night. My wife and I are out there. And I'm smiling. She goes, what are you smiling about? I said, I just got, I just got, was one of the nine people. Uh, she goes, for what? I said, I paid $500 for a half hour of this guy's time. And she was, she about choked. She's like, <laughs> what are you going to get for $500 for a half hour? I said, I know I'm curious to see too. Cause one day I would like to charge 500 bucks for a half hour. So I get with Ryan. First thing he asked me, do you have a $24,000 course? I'm like, hell no. He yeah. goes, I said, I got a $497 course. He goes, but didn't you say that you consult artists and you're a consultant? I said, yeah. He goes, what do they pay you? I said, $2,500 a month. He goes, uh, my friend, that's $30,000 that you get paid by this person. I know that's not a course, but you have something to offer for that. I'm like, 
Yeah, he says, then I want you to offer it. I'm like, okay. So I go to my email list and I said, hey guys, a lot of you are always asking me if I manage artists anymore. I, I take that as a compliment. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work individually with 12 people every week for the next year. And it's going to be, you know, five figures. If this is something that you're interested in, let me know. I was so reluctant to push play on the, on the email. I pushed yeah. send. Yeah. And the next thing you know, there were like 37 people that wanted to fill out an application to spend $25,000 a year with me. Come on. So I ended up going through, I took a, a, a dozen or so on and I went back to the hot tub. This was like, so I paid for my $500 on like a Thursday. I had my meeting with Ryan on a Monday. I made the offer on a Thursday. So a week later, I'm in the hot tub with my wife and I have this grin on my face again. And she's like, what are you smiling about? I said, remember that $500 that I invested in for that <laughs> half hour conversation with that guy? She's like, yeah. She goes, what did you get for it? I said, well, we got $180,000 in business. And she was just like, so now she never questions anything that I, I do at this time. But it was like that by having a professional that's not attached to my business, oh. listen, ask me a couple really good questions. Let me give them some answers. Give me some structure. I invested 500 and ended up generating 180,000. Was that a good investment of a half hour of someone's time? Most people would say at the beginning, what are you getting for that? No, it's, it's the knowledge that he gave me. I've been able to duplicate that over and over and over again. And I only paid for his time once. Hell fucking yes is my answer. Once. You know, I, I wouldn't have even questioned. That would have been the same as you. I, yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's figure it out, babe. Trust me. It's going to be worth it. And, and, you know, yeah. especially if you trust the source, right? You have to, you have sure. to vet the source, make sure it's, you know, it's legit. But, well, I just wanted to learn because I could have learned what I don't want to do when I spend a half hour with people, but I learned how yep. to ask really good questions. I learned just get to the point. There it's like, go. let's not sit there. He didn't want to hear my life story. That wasn't important. He goes, you obviously have a story or, you know, I can do research on that. It's like I tell people on Clubhouse, they're always like, you know, Rick, come to the room and tell everyone all your accolades. So it sounds great in the room. And I'm like, look, just tap on my profile. profile. What's the question? How can I serve you? And then all of a sudden my Instagram following goes on. So back to the original question with Clubhouse. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I think it's a great way uh, to, to network. I think it's a great way to serve others. And I'll leave you with this. If you go into everything you do with a servant's heart, the money will find you. Bam. My goal this year was, did I want to be scalable or did I want to be profitable? And what I learned is by not automating my customer service part of my business and not automating my followers and thank you for following me on Instagram, but me going and saying, hey, Nomad, what's up? It's Rick in a voice message that that got me closer to the sale by just spending eight seconds thanking somebody for following me versus putting them in an automated system. A lot of the marketing people will go, yeah, but it's not scalable. I go, no, but it sure is profitable. <laughs> uh, I love it. You said it yesterday. I heard all that on Clubhouse. I'm tuning back in. After this week, are you not going to do the power hour? Or you're, you're trying to host your own room? I'm going I'm going to. Okay. I went ahead and blocked out my calendar for the next six months. I will start Beautiful. my day there. Uh, one, because I do a lot of coaching. So it really warms me up for what I'll be doing with my clients and things like that. Yep. Uh, I do a webinar a week, so it's really good practice. As long as I can hear the problems people are having, it gives me ideas or products that I can create to help solve those problems because if five or six people have it, to me, that means thousands of people have it. Yep. Uh, one of those courses, we did a course we just created called Ads Amplifier for Music teaching artists how to run Facebook and Instagram ads. Mm -hmm. And I did it with an ad agency who charges $2,500 to start. They do a lot of work with major labels and major artists. And I said, but what about the person you can't take? What can we create for them? And dude, we killed it. There'll be uh, on my website, uh, there'll be a page of other resources and offers and things like that. But that ads amplifier for music course is absolutely going to be a game changer because it now allows everyone to be their own marketing agency and doing the same things that the agencies do. And we walk them step by step. We, we talk about, you know, for a discovery ad, this is the budget you want to use. This is the creative. This is the KPIs, which stands for key performance indicators. Right. This is the benchmark of if we know it worked, this is where you send people. And then we go in 
and build out the ad for them inside the Facebook ads manager, click by click, step by step. And no one had done that yet. And we are absolutely, I did it in beta with my folks and they absolutely loved it. Is this the one that I just found on Rick Barker and it's uh, 247? Uh, that's the ad social amplifier. media for music. Okay. What does it say? Ads amplifier for music? Ad, ads amplifier for music. It used to yeah. be 497. Now it's 247. Uh, actually, we're doing it for a buck uh, one forty seven at okay. some point. Yeah, we're okay. gonna, yeah, it'll 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 fluctuate, but yeah, you're yeah. looking at the right place. My web guy is building it out as we speak because I got another webinar tomorrow. So we're doing just in time changes to the website. So okay. he knows that his first focus needs to be social media for music because the upsell will be the ads amplifier. And that's a whole business conversation. If you ever want to do a podcast on how to create courses and start businesses, we should, we should do an episode. That'd be fun. I love doing that. Uh, I geek out on that stuff. Yeah. Consider it done. Mean. Consider it on the calendar. We're going to hit you. Yeah, back. I geek that. out on that. And I, I, and you know what I would love to do with you, which would be fun is to do a live zoom webinar with your community yeah. where they can come on and ask questions in real time and we can build out stuff for them in real time i would love it i would love yeah. it rick, yeah. rick you, you don't understand you're my guru uh you're, <laughs> you're gonna be my coach after this podcast is done we're gonna have a private two-minute conversation about how I can, I can make you my coach yeah it's only it's only five hundred dollars for a half hour right <laughs> <laughs> you already said you'd pay it i heard you say it Oh, yeah, Rick, no. you're killing me! I love it. No, I'm, I'm only a, I'm only a buck fifty a half hour. So I'm 150 a half hour, 300 an hour. That price will go up. But yeah, right. I already heard you say you'd pay it, so I'm. Going. <laughs> I love it. Hey, before you go, can I steal one more minute of your time for some rapid yeah. fire? And yeah, then you get to dinner with your wife and kids. Okay, we got we got a timer on the clock here. Okay, uh, rapid fire. I don't want you to think. You see it? Yeah, let me see if we we're gonna. We're, you don't want me to think. These are gonna be some really funny answers then. Because everything's going to be prints. You started it already, though. So, uh, hold, hold, that's all right. As long as as long as uh, we can see it. Eric, you're going to give me Eric G. You're going to give me the, the the countdown to the end, so I know okay. when it's coming. One minute. Here we go. All right. Here you ready? All right. Yep. In three, two, one, go. Name three business essentials. Trust, honesty, and do what it is that you say you're going to do. What entertains you? Hip hop. Social media account of yours that gets the most action? Instagram. Last concert you attended? Bruno Mars. Three top artists in your playlist? Prince, Eminem, and Sky Daddy. Instrument you wish you could play? The bass. Favorite city? Nashville. Guilty pleasure food? Oh, too many. Ribs. Ah, drink of choice if you have one. Uh, water. Favorite decade of music? 80s. Hidden talents. Tie a cherry stem with my tongue. <laughs> what, he, what would you do if you weren't doing this? <laughs> uh, professional golfer. You friends say you are? Obnoxious. Song or band Three, that changed your life? Two. Song what? Song that changed your life. Uh, live like you were dying, Tim McGraw. <laughs> live like you were dying, Tim McGraw. Love it. Perfect. Did we get it? Did we get it in time? We still got it, you know, but it yeah. doesn't matter. This is just for fun. Everybody's just, going water. I'm like, yeah, I'm like I said, I'm 28 years sober. I just drink a lot of water, you know. That's right, amazing. But I saw you smoking a nice stogie. Uh, it's my guilt. That, that's a guilty pleasure, which is cigars. Yeah, on the fireside chat, I love that. I did the fireside chat, and I, I I'm like beta testing for badges on Instagram. Yeah, and we did like 60 bucks. People tip like 60 bucks, and what I do with all my tips or revenue from the sale of merchandise is it all goes to music. It cares uh, because they help musicians during this time and stuff like that. But yeah, it was fun. It was amazing. amazing. So, love the fireside chats. Amazing. Rick Barker, we are so grateful for your time yes, yes, and your yes. knowledge, your wisdom. Dude, you're like tried and true, a career musician hero. Come on. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, all right. Musician Hall of Fame. There you go, baby. <laughs>